There we go. All right. I think, okay, it's 101. I'm going to begin. Okay. Great. Okay. Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Baldaya, Director of Curatorial Affairs for the Huntsville Museum of Art. And I'm here today with my colleague, David Reyes, Curator of Exhibitions and Collections for the Museum. We're pleased to be hosting the museum's fifth virtual artist talk and studio visit in connection with the exhibition, looking at the collection, The Elegant Vessel, which is currently on view at the museum through March 28th, 2021. Thank you all for joining us. Our guest today is featured artist Shane Farrow of Penland, North Carolina. Now, Shane is no stranger to the Huntsville Museum of Art. His work was featured in the exhibition, Breaking the Mold, New Directions in Glass, way back in 1996. That exhibition presented recent work by seven nationally emerging artists credited with expanding the role of glass as a contemporary art medium. Shane was also featured as an Encounters solo artist at the museum in 2008. And his evocative piece titled Jade Moonbottle was a particularly memorable work from the show and we were fortunate enough to subsequently be able to acquire it for the museum's collection. You see it on the screen right now. That piece has become a favorite with museum visitors and we're excited to have the opportunity to feature it again uh, in our Elegant Vessel exhibition. Now, before we begin, I wanna quickly thank our sponsors for the exhibition, the Alabama State Council of the Arts and the Huntsville Museum of Art Guild. I also wanna remind everybody that, that during the course of this program, you can use the Q&A button on your screen to type in any questions that you may have as we proceed, since we'll want to get to some of them at the end of the session. And now I will turn the proceedings over to David Reyes, who will introduce today's artist, Shane Farrow. David. Thank you, Peter. And good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Shane Farrow. Shane creates spirited works born of imagination and fire, utilizing the age old glass banking technique of lamp working which involves heating and shaping glass tubes and rods over an open flame. While formerly relegated to the science lab and novelty gift trade, lamp working has evolved into a fine art medium in Shane's hands. Shane Farrell was born in 1953 in Chicago, Illinois. After moving to Winter Haven, Florida in his teens, Shane began to delve into lamp working at the amazing Howells glass blowing shop where he worked after school and on weekends. A flame worker for over 50 years, Shane maintains a studio near the Penland School of Crafts in the picturesque mountains of Western North Carolina. Shane has taught at institutions such as Penland School, the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass, and Pilchuck Glass School, just to name a few. He has also participated in international symposia and conferences, lecturing and demonstrating his techniques around the world from Europe to China and as far away as Japan and Australia. He has had over 33 solo exhibitions since 1992 and has participated in over 400 group exhibitions during his career. He has been honored with three major retrospectives, first at the Berkowitz Gallery at the University of Michigan in 1999, at the Huntsville Museum of Art in 2008, and most recently at Christian Brothers University in 2010. His work can be found in over 30 museum collections, including the Glass Museum in Denmark, the Museum für Glaskunst in Germany, the Niijima Contemporary Glass Museum in Japan, the Museum of American Glass, and the Huntsville Museum of Art. We are pleased to have with us today, Shane Farrell. Shane? Well, thank you so much, Peter and David. I really appreciate uh, being invited and I appreciate your help. And also, I you know, I like that I've had a relationship with the Huntsville Museum over all this time. You know, it's been a special relationship. Um, I, I think I have a funny story about <clears throat> my previous work when I was in the 1996 exhibition were um, kind of surrealistic sculptures. And, you know, I knew that Peter liked them 
And then uh, before the uh, encounter show, I guess as what wife pointed out about this guy that made these glass birds and told Peter about it. And Peter goes, well, that's Shane Farrow. <laughs> so it was like a whole new body of work. Anyways, I'm going to present um, my slideshow later and it's gonna be preceded by a video of my studio, which is about five minutes long. But before that, I'd like to talk a little bit, um, I'm trying to make it concise, but my history, as uh, David said, I moved to Winter Haven from Chicago when I was 14 and I lived uh, near a lake um, really just, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred yards maybe from a lake. And I would ride my bike and on the lake, there was a group of shops. It was near Cypress Gardens, Florida. And that's where the Howell glassblowers were. And it was actually taken over by a, another um, man and his wife, Jerry and Lee Coker. Uh, but when I first went there, I, I would ride my bike there and watch this guy demonstrate, you know, and I was fascinated by it. I did it quite often. And then when the new couple, Jerry and Lee came, um, when I was 15, they uh, let me do odd jobs. And I actually, after a couple months, they said, you know, we, we think you might have some talent. We'd like to start training you. So I worked um, with them after school and on, on the weekends and, uh, Probably by the time I was about 16, I was already demonstrating for them to the public. So I've always kind of demonstrated in front of the public. And um, then another guy bought it and uh, it was moved, but eventually it ended up in Cypress Gardens and my family moved uh, about a hundred miles away and I stayed in Winter Haven because I was enrolled in Polk Community College. I was interested in philosophy and anthropology at the time. And uh, so I supported myself actually li living with this, uh, my new boss and his family for about two years. And so I was able to support myself uh, in my education by doing glass blowing. Uh, then in, when I was uh, 21, I, I, no, I guess I was, uh, yeah, I guess I was about 21 years old. I was invited up to um, the Adirondack Mountains to help run a glass studio in North Pole, New York. And uh, I was a glass blowing elf, <laughs> which was kind of funny. And um I was just there for the summer, like on sabbatical from my job, but I love the mountains so much that I just, and I met a girl there and I decided to stay. And I enrolled in Plattsburgh State University where I was going to school and still blowing glass. In 1976, I worked in Canada. Um, I owned part of a company and I demonstrated in like Montreal and, um, lots of other places in Quebec and Ontario. And then in 1990, 1977, I opened a gallery. I was only 24 years old in Plattsburgh with two of my philosophy majors. And uh, so all of a sudden I was freed up to make what I wanted. I, I wasn't controlled by what uh, the market was. And that's when I really began my you know, self journey with glass. Um, that lasted a few years and um, then that place closed and I opened another gallery that lasted six months. And then I decided at that time, either you're gonna be an artist or a gallerist. And I decided to be an artist. I went back to Florida. I was down there for eight years where I met my wife and I got married in 83 and we moved to Penland in 1990. So I've been here almost 32 years. And in 1990, um, I think it was a major change of direction for me coming here to Penland School. The community was supportive. I learned, I took my first hot glass class where you're working with a furnace and really expanded um, my vocabulary and my knowledge. And also it gave me lots of um, connections with people 
um, in the United States and around the world. At the same time, I joined the Glass Art Society, which is based in Seattle now, but it was actually formed at Penland School in 1971. Um, and that was another alter altering thing because then at the conferences, I met people from all over the world working in glass, very, very famous, you know, Dale Chihuly, the Lubinskys. And um, that also furthered my career. So it was kind of a two pointed thing in the same year. And that really forever altered my life. Later on, I became the uh, president of the Glass Art Society uh, from 2006. I served two terms to 2010, and I'm still involved with it on committees, and I'm the chairman of the history project there. So this opened up the possibility of me traveling and teaching around the world. And um, I'd never really even been out of North America until 1998 when I was invited to teach in Japan for the first time, um, which just preceded the gas conference there. And uh, I didn't teach uh, internationally last year because of COVID and I'm not planning to teach this year. I was supposed to teach last year in Germany, but the last place I did teach was in Turkey. And that was another great experience. Um, anyways, that's kind of a short version of my history. And I think now we would like to go ahead. I'm going to talk through uh, my slides. I want to say that my slides start at about when I had the gallery about 19, late 1977, 1978. I don't have earlier work on there and I don't really want to see it anyways. So. Um, Let's begin that. And while uh, Shane is setting up, I just want to remind folks about the chat function. You can use the Q&A tab to type in your um, questions. We'll get to those later. So um, I'm not going to say much because I'm talking. I made this video to show. And this will give you an idea. So I live right across Hi, from the Shane Farrow. This gallery. is my house and studio up here at Penland School. Beautiful setting. It's my porch cat. It's giddy. My studio before I owned this place was ceramic studio, flame working, maybe some other kinds of studios. And take you straight into my studio atelier. And this is an overview of it. I'd like to start now with this is part of my shadow box series. I know there's some glare here. This is the major arcana of the Tro deck, which are the 22 universals that interact with the everyday things in life. It's a close up of some of the sculptures. And move along here. I have pedestals on the windows. And this is a um, hot glass piece teapot series that I do in the hot glass studio with assistance and gaffer. So it's hot glass and flame working together. And then cold work, which I do. And then finally finished off the stopper with just pure flame working and cold working. It's kind of like the piece that's in the collection on exhibition right now. Here are some of my birds of my collection that belong to mostly my family, maybe to me. Usually I pick an iconic bird of a series, kind of a theme, and I keep one. This piece I did with Elizabeth Brim. 
who's a well-known blacksmith that lives at Penland. It's iron and glass. A nest piece, some birds, acorns, eggs in the nest, and some more birds of the collection. It's nice to have an atelier in your studio because uh, you need to relax. And nice to have a library for doing research. Here are some uh, sculptures that I've done and still continue to do. They're large, kind of larger scale, maybe even 20 inches tall, kind of uh, animal or bird hybrids, human. I actually showed, I think, a couple of these in a show at the Huntsville Museum in the 1990s. So moving along, I like to have this atelier sitting area in my studio for doing research and uh, just to relax, have people over to talk. Of course, it's not happening too much in COVID times. And I have my paintings on the wall. I have some uh, selection of birds on top of my larger annealer that are going to exhibitions or sent out to galleries. I have lots of music, CDs, albums. It's important for my work, some paintings on the wall. These are my powders, back deck, which is beautiful. I use these powders to do uh, coloration on my glass tubes for vessels and birds and other kinds of pieces. It's just ground up powdered glass. So it's like my palette. This is one torch I use, it is gas, oxygen, and air. And I use that in tandem with this torch here. Move around to the front. You can see the torch. This is just gas and air, kind of antiquated, but I find it useful. These are rods that I use that I pull from color bars that are used in the hot glass studio. Drafting table for drawing, painting. And some more paintings on the wall with a collection of some more of my vessels and shadow boxes over the years. And this is my ventilation system that I hand painted to go with the motif of my atelier. And that's it. Hi. So, it's kind of strange uh, to think that I've been doing this 52 years. I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't do something for 52 years. And, you know, I've even had questions for, you know, I guess in the last few years, like, are you going to retire? Well, absolutely not. Why would I? You know, I have a great time. Um, you know, besides doing the flame working, um, I you know, work out of the furnace. And also I do um, some casting of glass and as well as painting and other, you know, you'll see some slides of it. This is a uh, image uh, of me. I guess that's why I, I don't mind uh, demonstrating in front of people. This is my sister who passed away in 1996. Uh, we did a lot of different, uh, shows in dancing and I was in theater at the time. 
This is one of um, the first goblets that I, I made that I was really proud of. And this is when I owned the gallery. So this is all made out of a tube. When I had the gallery, um, like I said earlier, we had the opportunity to be, you know, quite open about what we made. We didn't really have to make what the tradition told us to do. So we were, I was interested in making abstract shapes, um, animals, things like that. Um, I usually made my own bases out of wood, um, exotic hardwoods that I would uh, cut up and hand polish, or I used driftwood for, th these are birds that I started back then. I did about 60 different species. These were solid birds um, though, and maybe only about an inch and a half to two inches um, in length. And I'd mount them on driftwood that I would find uh, generally like on Lake Champlain, which is right, you know, next to Plattsburgh, Baltimore Oriole, rose-breasted grosbeak, some beavers. I used rock and minerals and things too as bases. Um, this is the first human you know, realistic human head that I made. Um, and actually it, <clears throat> the, the uh, shoulders on it are actually beaver eaten wood <laughs> that um, I appropriated. And uh, this, this sculpture was interesting to me because I started with the skull and I added this, the features and the hair afterwards. So I, that's how I built it up anatomically speaking. If you look through one hole in the head, it was actually a, a complete color spectrum in the brain. So I thought that was a really interesting piece. A moose on um, ebony. So I went through various um, animal kingdoms, studying field guides, going out in the woods, whatever I could do, photographs to learn the different animal kingdoms, bird kingdoms, plant kingdoms, everything as part of my research. This was my first gallery and that's not me in the door there. Um, the, the one guy, that's me um, in the front on the right and the guy behind me, uh, directly was one of my partners and he was my apprentice at the time. Um, not only did we have a gallery, but at the time, which there wasn't that many craft, craft galleries at the time, we sold in New York City and Philadelphia and Washington DC to supplement our retail income. Um, Indian pipes, um, I've done a lot of sculptures uh, and I have a shadow box actually behind me that shows um, glass and painted Indian pipes. So I was always out in the woods. Uh, when I uh, actually closed my first gallery, I had musicians that would hang out at the gallery and I was always interested in music and I became a sound technician for a year for the band and we traveled New England and they put out an album and I was able to to work my glass when I wasn't on the road. Um, this is uh, a picture um, that I made that was in the Corning New Glass Review, I think in 1991. And this is fused acrylic paint on top of glass. It's a technique that um, I experimented with and still use. It's kind of interesting that you can apply other kinds of materials and fire them right into the glass. A set of cordial glasses. And these are all made from a glass tube that's covered in those powders you saw. And then I'm using shards that I blow out and break up into pieces. And I use the rods to kind of drawing. So kind of what I do with the vessel forms, especially and the birds um, is I'm basically kind of like painting on the glass. And that's how I approach each piece. Here's one of my spirit vessels, um, same kind of technique. 
uh, when I was younger, I made a lot of perfume bottles. And then all of a sudden around, I don't know, maybe 1988 or so, I decided that I could like expand upon the idea of a perfume bottle and make them sculptural and um, add interesting stoppers to them. Here's a vignette um, of wood that I painted. It's a street scene. Um, probably around 1989, 1990. Uh, more wine glasses. Another picture. Goblets. Goblets is is another, goblets are another series that I've done and I still make them sometimes. Uh, but I started, um, instead of like having a regular goblet, I, I had the idea of using figures as the stems. So they became more and more elaborate over a period of time. And also in the glass collector's world, uh, a lot of people collected glass goblets. They still do, but especially in the 1990s, it was a big thing. People had hundreds of these and now they're going into museums, collections. Um, my tribute to Picasso. I I've been very influenced when I was younger by the Surrealists, uh, Dali, well, Picasso, Tanguy, um, all kinds of Surrealists. I'm, you know, I'm really actually more influenced by um, the art world than I am by the glass world as to what I do. Uh, another picture. Um, then I started working in borosilicate glass. Most of the pieces I sh have shown so far are made out of soft glass, which is what you would use in the furnace. But this, this is uh, Borosilicate glass is used for scientific, but now it's kind of an art glass. Uh, lots of flame workers are using it. So this is called the Modern Woman Executive. And this was featured at a Pilchuck glass exhibit at SeaTac, uh, and also in an article, a uh, major glass magazine out of Germany as the front of piece of the article. So it's been flame work and then I sandblasted it. And this is about the birth of my daughter. I think I made this in 1993 after my daughter was burnt, born. This is, I use plate glass, which I uh, sandblasted. Um, so it's our pets and you know the hand of God and sun and the moon. My daughter has uh, a uh, quite the hair there with the, <laughs> That's kind of how her hair looked. And that's me in the back. This is called Over the Head of a Chauvinist Pig. Um, the TV has, is, you know, women's legs. And um, on the TV screen, I had uh, written uh, sex on it. But it has to do with kind of, <laughs> uh, well, you know. Here's another uh, shadow box here. Um, I did kind of a Miro series. Um, I don't know, somebody at, at an art show in the 19, late 1980s, I had heard of Miro, but people said, you know, your work kind of reminds me of Miro. And I was like, okay. So I started researching it and I saw what they meant. It's not a series that I'm doing anymore, but it's a nice series. 1991, I went to Pilchuck on a full scholarship to study with a German flame worker, uh, Kurt Volstab, who was known for doing these, this specialized technique. Um, here's a goblet. This was a commission. It's about 18 inches tall. Of course, I don't think you would drink out of it. <laughs> it's kind of heavy. Um, in 1993, I started doing more uh, shadow boxes. So I'm, I'll be showing you some examples of them. And they're kind of a interaction between whatever narrative that I'm going for. Um, it might include 
you know, collage, it might include photography um, and my interpretation of my narrative against the backdrop of that. Later on, I actually just started painting my own uh, shadow boxes in the backgrounds. This has to do with um, the vagaries of German ro uh, romanticism. I think this was made about 1995. Nineteen ninety-six. Um, this is a piece. It was an exhibition at the Glass Museum in Denmark. It was purchased. has has to do with uh, the vagaries of religious movements. Shed a box with um, flower or figurative botanical people. This, this is called um, an alchemical dance. I was always interested in kind of the imagery of alchemy, plus the idea of it, because it was always associated with glass. This is a stopper of one of my uh, spirit vessels. Little um, ruby-throated hummingbird man. Blue jay and a chickadee. Here's a set of these uh, bottles here. Um, I think the title of this grouping was called Primarily Spanish. They, these were about a foot tall. Halloween girl. This was right after my uh, daughter Devin was born in uh, 1992. You can kind of see her little mohawky thing there with her hair. And this was our previous residence, um, which was kind of right just behind Penland School down a road. It was our dog. And my studio was in the downstairs part. It had big windows, like an open basement. But we just rented that place before we bought our house now. And this is what it looks like walking down the road. My house would be down there on the left. That's my wife. And this is my wife, Gemini. She's a Gemini, so I made this sculpture in tribute to her. And this is a side view. So you can see a lot of my sculptures have kind of a dance movement to them. I really like that movement. This was kind of a, what I thought was a futuristic uh, self-portrait of us as a couple. And I did these series of um, kind of flower goblets or um, here's a Madonna piece that I did for a museum show, uh, Asheville Art Museum. You bring out the wolf in me. Um, the con the conquistador brings uh, back the bull. <laughs> Capricorn. So most of these sculptures can, they can be up to like 20 inches tall. This one's probably about, I don't know, 15 or 16 inches tall. Uh, I'm very influenced by um, Japanese and Chinese or Asian art. 
and have been since I was young. So you kind of see that influence in this one. It's another portrait of my wife. I guess this is about 16 inches tall. This is a tree of life that I did um, that was given to some Swami um, in a big ceremony of 5,000 people in New Jersey. Um, I was commissioned to make this and it was lit from behind. So it's the tree of life. It actually has orange sections for the color of the robes of the monks of that order. Another picture is my daughter got older on some property that we own near Penland, which we still own, but we don't have any structures on it. And this is me uh, working on coloration of a bubble with uh, John Getze, who's a local glass blower. I always worked with somebody, usually two other people to make the vessels. So ironically, this is the piece and this, this is in the collection of the Corning Museum. It's about 24 inches tall, I think. Another place that I teach is in Frauenau in uh, Bavaria. It's a uh, school like modeled kind of after Penland, uh, started by Erwin Eich, the famous uh, kind of glass and painter, a uh, friend of Harvey Littleton's. Um, they were very close. and. Uh, it's near three different glass factories in a very rural village, which is only about five miles from the Czech border. So it has a history of hundreds and hundreds of years of glass. And um, I teach there quite often. This is a piece I did for my sister that passed on. All she wants to do is dance. Another floral goblet. Some of my earlier birds, probably 2003 or something like that. Another shadow box. It's called the astronomy box. Another spirit vessel. This is a desert, uh, this is a collaboration with a photographer who's now passed on, it has to do with the desert and shadows. Blue Jay Babe. Um, I also was a visiting artist at Harvey Littleton studio where he did vitriography and he had brought in artists from all over the world to do residencies and use using glass plates in with different techniques to be able to do printing. So the first time I was a visiting artist there, the first, I was at, I did it twice, 1994. And um, this one is one I did, I think it was 2004 like 10 years, 10 years later. And this is one I did there too. So I engraved this with engraving tools and then printed off that. Uh, here's a shadow box. This one is in the Museum of American Glass in Millville, New Jersey. Close up. I always thought the little guy on the top there to the right is like, kind of reminded me of uh, Ronald Reagan. Floral goblets. I like to do those kind of uh, non-symmetrical goblet tops because actually you'd think that they'd be easy, but actually it's harder to pull those off than something that's symmetrical. Bamboo goblets. This is from the first time that I taught in Japan. 
I think I've taught there four times now. And you can see how it kind of relates to Japan. Bamboo um, spirit vessels. Uh, this is my tribute to uh, Paul Clay's drawing of senile birds. It's kind of like a senile bird woman. It's about 18 inches tall. So it's, it's kind of big and it was kind of hard to hold the sculpt. Uh, I'm always like hiking around where I'm, where I'm at, you know, looking at animals and birds. This is uh, Mount Snowden in Wales. Uh, Chester, England. This is called Gothic Tulip. One of my first bird configurations with blueberries. This one's in a children's neonatal care um, in Charlotte, North Carolina for, you know, kids to look at. It's in a case. I was awarded, I'm a, my second major thing that I do besides art is cook. I'm known as a, as a gourmet chef and I was awarded this in Japan. I guess they don't give these out unless they know you're, you're really a good cook. Another bottle. This is kind of a hot glass and flamework piece um, that I own that I made out at Pilchuck with a crew of five people. It's a big, heavy piece, solid glass. I think this, this piece was in the exhibition at Encounters, wasn't it? This bot, small bottle. as that one was too, it was a group of three. Canada Goose. I'm not always trying to make actual species anymore like I did when I was younger. I, I'd rather just kind of like, you know, base it on something and then go in my own direction. So I think, I made a lot of these blueberries for a while with some of these configurations. They were kind of funny because they were blown and they were really super large. So there was kind of a surreal aspect to it. This was the third piece in that grouping in the show. Another floral uh, box. Um, this painting was in the show at Encounters. I remember that, it's in the catalog. Most of these acrylic paintings uh, are about 30 by 40 inches. So they're not small. This is a self portrait. I sometimes associate, I actually, I actually made the glass chair first. So sometimes I make something and then I paint it. It's, it's kind of a reversal. And actually, uh, I laid the groundwork of the, the painting of this um, by laying the paint down and then using a glass tube as a brayer to set the background of it. So you can see how these glass powders interact with each other. They can open up, they have different viscosities that is technically kind of difficult to deal with, but can give you great results because one one glass over the other one might be harder stiffer than the other so it it reacts differently this is called phylogenesis it's actually behind me over there So here's what I was talking about, the Indian pipes. There are some dried Indian pipes and it's relative, which is pine sap. And I've drawn or painted the uh, 
pine sap in the Indian pipes. And there's all kinds of sayings of, or its uses, uh, Native Americans, and then the sculptural glass pieces. You can see kind of a close up. It's a wall piece. This is glass that I made with a team. It was about, I don't know, maybe 30 inches wide. So it looks like a piece of driftwood, but it's actually all glass that we made. And then I sandblasted and acid etched it. Another bottle, another painting. Of course, there's, you know, part of the wall. This is after um, a, um, a ruin on the coast of England. Uh, it's supposed to be King Arthur's castle probably really isn't. I like the birds, you know, actually melt, kind of melting out of the wall, <laughs> growing out of the walls. More acorns nests. It's a piece I did with Elizabeth Brim, who I mentioned earlier. We've done, we even had a show at Blue Spiral together a few years ago. It's right behind me. Blue Jay bottle. I'm always fascinated by the architecture and, and the buildings wherever I'm traveling. So this is called Europa. And this is the, the church in the middle of town of the Frauenau that I was talking about where the school is. There's lightning dancers in the vault. It's me in New, New Zealand. Kind of miss not traveling 14 months now. It's another like botanical box. Bloodroot always um, kind of intrigued me. They should be coming up right now in the woods. And I have dry, dry stuff and put it in bottles or seal it up. Try to replicate it in glass. Most of these bottles, I work with different artists, uh, but the most recent one I've worked with is Pablo Soto, who I don't know if he, uh, he was married to Christine Cordoba, the ceramicist and lived right behind me and had his glass studio. I made this tribute to where I live in outside of Spruce Pine. I'd say this is about, I don't know, 28 inches tall. It's a picture of the Nijima Ferry. I'm flying over it while my students are going back to Tokyo. Peace with Elizabeth. A small teapot. I make a teapot series out of flame working and in hot glass. And these are the beginning of some watercolors, which I'll show you some. This is kind of called Dark Harvest. It's one of my watercolors. They're usually 11 by 14 or nine by 12. And, and I just finished nine of them recently, took a little break from glass. Another piece with Elizabeth. Um, I made this with a Chinese artist. And these are very primal symbols in very, very ancient China that I wrote all over it in flame working. You can see that more and more I started using uh, more and more flowers. This is about 30 inches tall. This uh, is a mountain landscape. And uh, 
you know, the performance of do, doing flame working or glass blowing in front of the public was done at the World's Fairs, especially like in, in the Chicago World's Fair in um, 1893. Um, this, this was in uh, 1930s. They did one in New York and they did one in San Francisco when they had the two World's Fairs. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic, Shane. That was well. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful work, and really nice to see the breadth of of work that you're creating. Um, we've got a couple of questions here, and we have just a little bit of time that we can ask them. Sure. Um, so uh, Jane asks, uh, what led to your interest in birds? And kind of as a also another question that's related to that, Yvonne asks, are you a bird watcher? Well, you know, I, I was interested in birds. Um, I don't, I don't actually remember being, uh, all that interested in birds when I lived in Chicago, you know, I'm sure I paid attention to them, but, you know, moving to Florida that you have all those Floridian birds, egrets and herons and things like that. And, you know, ha living right almost so close to a lake, I would see a lot of birds like that. And so the combination of that and also because in glass, people have always made birds, you know, just like in art. And, you know, one probably one of the first kind of animal-like things that I learned to sculpt, which was very, very small and probably very, very kitschy, was a bird. And, um, like I said, so that, I actually learned how to blow birds too out of tubes at that time. But again, they were very kitschy, not like what I do now. It kind of comes from a German tradition of blowing uh, glass birds and animals out of tubes rather than solid sculpture. So I had that, had that uh, capability to be able to do that because I was taught how to do some of these techniques. Um, but, you know, really the main fascination of birds is when I moved to the Adirondacks, when I had that gallery, when I became also a bird watcher and belonged to the Audubon Society. So I would hike a lot, which I still hike, you know, and I would try to identify birds. So I have a life, life list and <clears throat> I probably don't pay as much attention to the life list now, but, you know, now I have the field guides from all the countries that I go to, wherever I go to, I'm looking for birds. And they're, a, they're usually an inspiration. If I don't actually make that particular bird, I may appropriate some color scheme or some kind of patterning or something like that out of it, which is really what I would rather to do, to be honest. Yeah. Just kind of make up, make up your yeah. own. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, we've got another question here, um, and this will probably be our last question that we'll be able to ask, but um, how much are you influenced by myths? Uh, that early piece uh, with the Zeus head, it seemed to kind of start you off. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's I think I became interested in myths. I, I was quite, I was a pretty vociferous reader even when I was young. I, I actually was interested in Egyptology when I was nine years old. So that started kind of the, you know, other than, you know, Christian mythology. And um, I think that started me on a whole path there. And then I just, you know, went from there. And of course, if you're, if you're studying um, you know, anthropology and you're studying religions and you're studying all these types of things that, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe philosophy might be the umbrella of it. You know, Joseph Campbell, um, you know, became influential later on for me. You know, I read lots of Greek mythology when I was young, Roman mythology, which was very much related and, um, you know, I just found that that was all fascinating. You know, I, I guess something that I should have really mentioned was two things. One is that I felt 
um, I think I was 22 is before the gallery. I was talking to one of the guys that ended up being part of the gallery briefly. He was, you know, sort of a minor partner. And I and another guy were talking and I said, you know, now that we're like free to make what we want, you know, wouldn't it be interesting because, you know, we just see flame working. It's like, you know, it might be really good. It, stuff in Europe was definitely a little bit higher quality than the American, but wouldn't it be cool if we made things that had, you know, mythology uh, infused into it, psychological dimensions, uh, philosophical, you know, different kinds of mind uh, infusions into what you made. And so that really prompted me. Um, the other thing too is, um, I do work from my dreams and I had my partner that you saw in the photo in front of classical glass. I would send him slides after we separated and show him what we, what I was making and he, he wouldn't reciprocate. So one time I had a dream and I, I, I went into his studio. I didn't know it was in his basement actually, but that's what I dreamt. I went in the basement and I, I saw these incredible figures and, they were kind of like mythological figures made out of all these colors. And I woke up from the dream and I was kind of intimidated and jealous actually that he had made these. But of course I, I manufactured all this in my dream. So I started making them and I visited him some years later. And of course he hadn't made anything like that <laughs> at all. <laughs> so, you know, I guess it's also kind of a surrealistic, uh, I mean, a lot of surrealists did that, you know, work from dreams. So anyways. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, and I can't believe the hour has gone by so fast. Shane, your work is so fascinating. It's um, very eclectic. Um, and it really covers a lot of different approaches and different media. And the bottles with the bird stoppers and the flowers, they are just so exquisite. I'm glad we have a really good example of one in our collection, as well as a shadow box um, that we acquired from the first show that we did with you back right. in the 1990s. Um, I do want to thank you again, and I want to thank everybody who signed up for this session today. Um, I want to give a brief plug for our next uh, session, which will occur on April 19th, when we will talk with artist Althea Murphy Price from her studio in Knoxville, Tennessee. Althea's work is currently featured at the museum in an Encounters solo exhibition. And you can sign up for that session now by visiting the museum's website, which is below um, on the slide. In the meantime, um, come out and see the elegant vessel. It's only up for another week or so. So time is running short. It's a great show. And it'll be a wonderful opportunity to refamiliarize yourself with Shane's work or see it for the first time as well. Again, thank you, Sean, and thank you all for joining us and enjoy the weekend. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you.